On August 28, 1955, a 14-year-old boy was kidnapped and murdered in Mississippi. Emmett Till had whistled at a white woman. His murderers were never convicted. Emmett's younger cousin, Simeon, saw the kidnapping, and as Ephraim Graham tells us, he eventually forgave the men responsible. Isaiah 11 and 6 reads, a little child will lead them. And in some ways, that is the story of the fight against racism in America. We were not going to take segregated buses any longer. It was a child who inspired Rosa Parks when she refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus in Alabama, December 1st, 1955. That child was Emmett Till a 14-year-old Chicago boy who made headlines only four months earlier. He was kidnapped and lynched while visiting family in Mississippi. At the age of 12, could you imagine going to sleep at night and wake up the next door, your, your whole world is upside down? Emmett was visiting his cousin Simeon Wright that summer. They were sleeping in the same room when two men showed up at the Wright family's home. See, when they awakened Wheeler, they said, this is the wrong boy. We're looking for the fat boy from Chicago. And they knew who they were looking for. At that time, I weighed about 90 pounds, and Emmett weighed about 140. They were J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant. Bryant owned the country store where Emmett and his cousins had stopped to buy candy just a few days earlier. Well, Emmett and I, we had walked out. We was in the store together. We had walked out of the store. And Mrs. Bryant came out behind us, and she was walking towards a car, and then Emmett whistled at her, and it scared us half to death. The whistle at Carolyn Bryant, Roy Bryant's wife, was a joke to the 14-year-old from Chicago, who was always trying to make his cousins laugh. He didn't understand the unspoken rules of the segregated South. Color didn't mean anything to him. I mean, you're a human being. We're all the same. So he grew up like that. Emmett Till's family called him Bobo, and this is what he looked like before August 28, 1955. Simeon describes that day as the longest day of his life, and the first day there was no laughter in his childhood home. Emmett's body was found three days later in the Tallahatchie River. It was tied to a cotton gin. The body was so badly damaged that we couldn't hardly just tell who he was, but he happened to have on a ring with his initials. Simeon's father identified the body before it was sent to Emmett's mother, Mamie Till Mobley in Chicago. I didn't see the ear, where's the ear? And that's when I discovered a hole about here and I could see daylight on the other side. Mrs. Mobley wanted the world to see what she saw. She left her son's casket open at the funeral for the thousands who came. Even more would see his face on the cover of Jet Magazine where 12-year-old Simeon saw it for the first time. At 12, I, I know I didn't understand it all, but I understood what I saw. I saw the injustices that took place, and it affected me. It's taken more than 50 years for him to talk about his cousin's death. He shares his pain in the book, Simeon's Story, the very first eyewitness account of Emmett Till's kidnapping. I was enraged and embittered by the verdict. I saw for the first time the evil that was in the heart of the segregationists. The all-white jury found J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant not guilty in the murder trial, and there was never a trial for the kidnapping. I was angry, yes, because of what happened. Because the, the justice system in Mississippi failed us, our neighbors failed us, Leaving that trial, looking back at the, the, the white population rejoicing because these men was acquitted, I had the thought in my head, I said, we had no one to help us. Did you hate those white men? I don't think I know how to hate, but I wanted to get even. I wanted to revenge. Simeon and his family moved from Mississippi to Chicago not long after the trial, but the distance could not erase his anger. If I was provoked, we'd try to get even. Now, I remember one case, I, there's a young lady in, in my classroom, she was from Alabama, and she did something, nothing, nothing serious, and I, I think I slapped her. He turned to alcohol early in his adulthood, until something unexpected happened one night at a Chicago bar. 
at age 22, God forgave me of my sins. That's what changed me, really. When I was sitting in this tavern and I heard the voice of the Lord said, if you're dying your sins, you're going to hell. And, and man, I tell you, my life wasn't the same again. That voice inspired him to forgive the men responsible for the death of his cousin. Needless to say, the death of Bobo and the acquittal of his murderers left the hole in my heart. How did you learn to forgive them? Forgiveness is something that's not easy. Just because I said that, it's not, it wasn't an easy process. It's, it's a process that you have to, it's an act of your will, you have to do it and then fight through it. And then the deliverance comes. At 67, Simeon says he has also forgiven Carolyn Bryant, the woman who testified Emmett did much more than just whistle. She is Emmett's only surviving accuser. I feel if I met her, I probably, she probably could repent of what she did. I think she want to, but she probably don't know how. Simeon says he'd like to meet her and show her how. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. That's very easy to say you forgive and very hard to do. Simeon talks about it. He says, you know, you got to fight on through. You know, maybe you haven't had your cousin kidnapped and then tortured and then murdered. And then when you know who it is that, that did it, uh, well, they walk free. And what do you do with that? How do you deal with that kind of um, pain? And that sense of injustice, you know, what, what do you do with that? Uh, do you start saying, well, all white people are bad? Do you well, try to narrow it down to um, all segregationists are bad? And, and where do you ever come to forgiveness? Jesus talked a lot about forgiveness. Uh, you find it over and over in the Gospels. And his disciples... Um, got it through their heads, and he's serious about this. He's serious about forgiveness. And so Peter, one day, he came to him, and he wanted to say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm doing good here. Uh, if my brother sins against me, how often do I forgive him? And he, he thinks he's being large. I, I'm going to forgive him seven times. And Jesus responds and says, well, it's not just seven times. How about seven times 70 and he really wants to emphasize this is a big number. And on top of it, he gives a very interesting parable. And Jesus liked to te teach in parables. And these stories give us a whole lot more about what he means uh, when he says seven times 70. And he gives the parable about a kingdom where a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Well, one of his servants owed him a lot of money, and it was 10,000 talents. In today's economy, it would be over a billion dollars. Can you imagine trying to pay that back if you're a servant? He wasn't able to pay. And so the master said, all right, uh, I'm going to sell you. I'm going to sell you, your wife, your children, and everything that you have. I'll take that money, uh, and I'm going to sell you into slavery. The servant fell down before him, and he says, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Even though the debt is beyond payment, he's still pleading and pleading. If you'll just wait and have patience, I'll pay you all. Well, the master was moved with compassion, and then released him and forgave him the entire debt. Now, if you're a Christian, you've had a massive debt repaid. Uh, no amount of anything that you could do could possibly pay for all the sins that you've committed. But Jesus comes and kingdom of heaven comes and says, I'll take that debt. I'll pay it. I'll do it all. Now, you're forgiven. You're forgiven of a debt of 10,000 talents, more than you could ever possibly pay. And what do you do? Well, you do what the servant did. He knew that somebody else owed him a small amount. In the Bible, it's 100 denarii, which is it's kind of like owing $20. And, and he lays hands on him. 
And he took him by the throat and says, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet, begged him with the same line, have patience with me and I will pay you all. This time it was actually possible for it to be paid. But no, the servant who had been forgiven 10,000 talents would not throw him into prison, debtor's prison, until he should pay the debt. Now, the king who had forgiven the 10,000 talents found out about it. Other servants came to him and let him know this is what his, the one he had forgiven had done. Well, this is the response. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay him all that was due him. Now, we sometimes forget what unforgiveness does. You know, we get delivered to torturers. Now, who are these torturers? Well, it's you. Every time you relive the injustice that was done to you, you torture yourself. The event is over. In many cases, it's long gone. The people that did you wrong, in all likelihood, have forgotten about it. Maybe if they were reminded, they'd wince and regret what they had done, but they're not even there usually. And you torture yourself with the memory of it. You torture yourself that there was no justice. You torture yourself that the debt has not been paid. And literally, you hurt yourself. You hurt yourself phys physically. A lot of medical diseases are based on how much unforgiveness we have. You know, the doctors are talking about how uh, heart disease, hypertension, some of the diseases of inflammation are all linked back to this. That we're harboring bitterness in our heart. We're harboring unforgiveness. And with that, we're literally torturing our own bodies. It also affects us, just as it affected Simeon, that we'll have outbursts of anger that aren't based on anything happening today. You heard his story. There was a woman from Alabama. Doesn't he remember what he, she said? But because of the unforgiveness in his heart, he slapped her. He, he took it out on her. And we do that too. We allow all our unforgiveness to come back in moments that are entirely inappropriate. And we take it out on people who are usually weaker than us. We take it out on children. We take it out on each other. And it's all because we haven't forgiven. And this is what Jesus is talking about. That in the kingdom of heaven, this is exactly what happens. That if we don't forgive from our heart, if we don't do that, then we don't get the release we're looking for. And he says it very plainly. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. What, a, what an incredible statement. So my heavenly Father will do to you. He'll literally allow you to be delivered over the, to the torturers until you finally forgive from your heart. Now, Jesus wasn't just preaching with words. He preached with actions, too. And you see it plainly when he's hanging on the cross. He's been beaten by Roman soldiers. There's no reason for him to have been beaten. He was tortured, put a crown of thorns on his head, put a purple robe. They spit on him. They blindfolded him. They taunted him. They mocked him. All his friends left him. He was alone. They abandoned him. One of his own disciples betrayed him. He was put in front of a court. 
innocent, yet found guilty. There's no justice. And then finally, stripped, hanging on a cross, he says some of the most amazing words ever spoken. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's the standard for us as Christians. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when we do that, and we do that from our heart, then we run into the greatest secret in the kingdom of God. We run free, no longer subject to the torture of unforgiveness. Today, will you resolve to do that? To walk free. And don't let the past torture you anymore. Maybe you've had great injustice. Maybe you've had injustice as great as what happened to Emmett Till. But if you'll only let it go and find some way to forgive, then you can walk in a newness of life that you haven't known before. Simeon says it. He started forgiving. And then he had to fight his way through and fight his way through to peace. And that can happen to you. If you need help with this, you need somebody to pray with you just to get things off your heart. You don't have to leave your name, but call us. 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I need to forgive somebody. I want to be able to do it out loud. And I want to be able to do it confidentially. Call 1-800-759. 0700.